Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our last APEM event of 2021. It's a collaboration event between Aspire and Latinos at EDF. Uh, this event will be a cooking demo plus a conversation with Hungry Ones, who are here right now in front of you. They're two brothers exploring their Asian Latino roots one bite at a time. Uh, and the brothers of Hungry Ones will show us how to cook their recipe for arroz chafa, aka Chinese Peruvian fried rice, while sharing their stories of growing up in a Peruvian Chinese Colombian family. Okay, so my name is Lumi, and I'm one of the co-leads for Aspire, as well as a member of the digital advocacy team in the membership department, and I'm based out of DC. I'd also like to introduce Georgia Ray, who's a member of our steering committee, and will be helping to facilitate the conversation with the chefs later. Let me, um, let me, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to figure out Zoom stuff. <laughs> okay, Georgia, would you be able to introduce yourself a little bit? Of course. Um, I don't think I'm on screen, but I'm Georgia. I'm a principal guest coordinator here at EDF on the development team. I'm based out of uh, New York, and you will see me again in about, oh, you'll see me again in about 30 minutes to um, just get a Q&A rolling. But I'm very happy to be here and to share this last event with all of you. Awesome. Thank you, Georgia. Okay, so now I'll say a little bit about what APEM is and also about Aspire before I turn it over to Monica, who is a co-lead for Latinos at EDF. So Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, aka APEM, occurs every May and it's meant to be a month dedicated to celebrating our community's histories and cultures. And our programming for the whole month has uh, done just that as well as exploring some of the issues that our communities have had to wrestle with throughout history up to the present day. Um, Aspire, our group stands for Asian Pacific Islanders Represent and Empower, which really is a, an encapsulation of our mission to provide an inclusive and equitable space for all Asian Pacific Islanders at EDF to flourish and help build a more DEIJ oriented culture and environment at EDF. So if you want to be a part of Aspire, but are not yet, um, or would just like to become part of a really great and fun community, you can definitely get involved with Aspire. Right now, we meet at least once every two months, um, as well as with other events spread throughout the calendar year, and we hold at least one safe space conversation a month. You can email me to be added to our email list, and you can also join the Aspire Slack channel. Um, and if you do identify as Asian Pacific Islander and you want to join our safe space conversations, you can contact me personally via Slack or email and we'll make sure to invite you. Okay, now I'll turn it over to Monica. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining and thank you Lumi for letting Latinos at EDF be a part of this incredible event which we're super excited for. It could not be a perfect, a more perfect fusion and a what better way to celebrate culture than through food. Uh, so my name is Monica von Hillebrand. I am one of the co-leads of Latinos at EDF alongside Michelle Melendez. Shout out to Michelle. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, I currently work in Catalyst Circle within development as a stewardship officer working out of the DC office. And uh, basically Latinos at EDF's mission is to celebrate the passion and diverse cultures of people who have roots in Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries. We identify ourselves in many ways by country of origin as Hispanic, as Latinos, Latinas or Latinx and beyond. We honor our differences and what unites us, including our deep respect for the environment and our desire to make EDF a more inclusive organization. Latinos that EDF strives to provide a safe space, an educational space, and a social space where all are welcome. So similar to Aspire, we have meetings about every, uh, every two months, and then we provide a safe space exclusively for Latino staff once a month. And similar to Aspire as well, feel free to email me or Michelle or uh, Slack us and join our Slack channel, which is Latinos underscore at underscore EDF. And if you want any more information, we're happy to provide that. And uh, we'll be offering a few other events on environmental justice through the Latino lens and um, just a huge 
I don't know, a, a good variety. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining and, and feel free to let us know if you have any questions. Kick it back to you, Lumi. All right, and I'll kick it right to the chefs. Um, you guys can introduce yourselves, say a little bit about what Hungry Ones is, and then you can go right into our cooking demo. Well, guys, well, thank you guys so much. I'm Andrew, half of Hungry Ones, and my brother over there, John at one. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really excited to be here when uh, Joshua, Josh reached out to us um, after watching, I think, one of our reels on Instagram. He's like, we should do an event together. So we, uh, we're super excited. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about us and how we got started. We started about a year ago, uh, a YouTube channel called Hungry Wands. And uh, we basically like to just tell our story with food. Like uh, Lumi said, we're Chinese, Peruvian, Colombians, uh, Colombians on uh, Colombian on my mother's side and Chinese Peruvian on my, on my dad's side. And we grew up in New York City. Um, and we just figured, you know, like we've always had a passion for this. John as a chef, uh, I like to eat. I eat most of the stuff that he cooks. <laughs> Uh, and we just love like having fun around the kitchen and connecting with people. And I think that's really what it's all about. So that's what we've been doing the last year. Um, we do private events and collaborations and just fun videos. Um, and Jonah, maybe you, you can introduce yourself. Hey guys, I'm Jonah. Uh, yeah, so like Andrew said, I'm the other half of Hungry Wands. I'm more, more so in the kitchen. And uh, I migrated from a career in finance into food hospitality and had to pivot a year and a, a year and a half ago with the pandemic. So you know, sort of food media and the cultivation of Hungry Wands was something that, you know, Andrew and I had always discussed. And through our travels, uh, you know, in South America and in Asia, and of course, you know, having that unique background and growing up in such a unique place, we just enjoy food storytelling and breaking down barriers through food storytelling. So again, we're delighted to be with, with you guys today and hopefully you guys can learn something. Uh, ask a whole bunch of questions. And uh, again, this is our style of uh, arroz chaufa and uh, it's really versatile. So it can be, you know, you can obviously substitute uh, vegetarian options, but we'll get into that as we go. Um, but yes, so thank you so much. I guess we can get right into it, Andrew, unless you wanted to say anything else before we start. Ah, I think we should get to it. People are hungry. <laughs> All right, so I guess there's a lot of different variations, right, of arroz chaufa, but if we talk about the story of how you know, like our story, right? Talk about Gong Gong, right? Our grandfather and how he immigrated from Hong Kong to South America. And with him, you know, along with a lot of other people, he brought the culture and the customs and the techniques of cooking and also the ingredients. So when that mix happened in, in Peru, that's basically what gave birth to dishes like this, right? Dishes like Lomo Saltado, dishes that uh, utilize a lot of uh, wok hay cooking technique, which is basically involving a huge carbon steel wok. Um, and then also ingredients, right? Soy sauce, ginger, garlic, um, and then even mixing with Peruvian uh, national uh, sauces and spices like aji amarillo, which we have here. So I guess really quickly, we can go through the ingredients of what we're gonna do here. Really important when you're making fried rice is actually the rice has to be a day old and it has to be as dry as possible. So I cooked this yesterday and what I did was I laid it out on a sheet pan so that it would dry and I put it in the fridge overnight, uncovered. And what I did was to really, really make sure that each granule was separated. I put a little bit of oil and I just massage them through my fingers gently, trying not to break it up too much. But again, it's really important when we're cooking this dish that it's everything is dry, right? We want to cook all of the moisture out of each component. That's why it's important uh, in the order of the steps in which we cook. So I guess with that, we can get it straight into the ingredients. What we have here is a Chinese sausage. This is lap chong. So this is a, a sweet and savory cured Chinese sausage. It has uh, a five spice powder. It has um, a lot of different aromatics. It's super good. It's, it has a lot of, a lot of fat, as you can tell, in there. So that's going to really caramelize and lend a lot of flavor. We have uh, some just simple red pepper here. And everything here is cut to a similar size so that they cook evenly and at a simpler, uh, simpler time. We have some uh, purple onion about a tablespoon of ginger and garlic. This is minced as finely as possible. Again, we really want it to be super small so that each bite you get a little bit of each component. This is really important, which is our scallion whites. These were you know, the ends of the scallion, the, the tops we're gonna use here and garnish, but these really uh, give us a great base uh, balance of flavor with the scallion oil essentially. 
So this is an inter the interesting uh, ingredient. This is the ají amarillo. So you can usually find this in a, in a Latin grocery store. It's fruity, it's spicy, it's, it's really complex and it adds a real nice umami and a depth of flavor to this dish. So again, a little bit will go a long way. Um, usually it's found frozen in those like in a, in a grocery section, but uh, you know, you can find it like in a, in a pre-made jar. I can, we can make sure that we link a, a whole bunch of stuff later. Uh, again, we have, so we have the scallion greens. We have some simple carrot and green peas just for a little uh, vibrancy in color and different texture. We're going to use two regular eggs. We're just going to give them a nice whisk, whisk and scramble them. And we cut up about five to six really small, medium sized shrimp. And I just split them in half. Really important that you season these beforehand, that you dry them thoroughly, right? Again, moisture is our enemy here, right? We want, we want, we don't want any moisture. We don't want to steam anything. We want to like sear it in oil. Okay. Oh, all right, here we go. So I guess let's just get right started. I, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to move the camera angle so that you guys can see a little bit better what's going on. Um, so let's do that. Jonah, while you're moving, we already have a question from the audience. So they want to clarify uh, the red pepper. Is that bell pepper? Yes, it's a sweet red, uh, red bell pepper. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, you can substitute any pepper here. Uh, so it's really important. Again, we're just going to go in a specific order. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to sear off our shrimp first really quickly to get some nice color, get some nice caramelization and crust. And then we're going to put that, put it aside. Then we're going to repeat the process with the lap chong. Again, put it aside. Then we're going to get our aromatics going. And honestly, this dish really comes together super quickly. I know obviously we're describing every single step, but as long as you do your, your preparation beforehand, your mise en place, um, and you, you know, have everything out laid out, this will be done in under five minutes. So once we get going, you know, that, that's again, that's, that's why we really love this dish because you can utilize anything from the fridge, right? Leftovers, we can easily substitute asparagus, mushroom, right? We can keep it completely veggie. We can put some tofu in here as well. But again, it's really important uh, to extract all the water from those components. So, you know, feel free to hit us up with questions if you have uh, uh, questions about the recipe, but other than that, we can get right to it. So I, I, here I've already put some neutral oil Okay, um, and it's really important that you get this super, super hot, right? I mean, John, one big advantage that you have is you have gas. I think when you're cooking, gas is so much better in terms of how you can control the heat, but also how hot you can get it. And you can't really get that on electric. So for people that have electric, uh, if they can get a little mini gas thing, if they ever want to cook on the walk, but it makes a big difference. Yeah, and just absolutely right. Uh, this would be super hard on a, you know, a, one of the ring coils or something flat. You really need that fire. Um, just to give you an example, right? If, if you're having restaurant quality wok hay, wok hay is, is the term for the type of Cantonese cooking where, which incorporates the fire and the oil. And it's a smoky flavor that basically like ingrains every single rice grain that we're gonna do here. But the BTUs in those restaurants, over 25,000, right? Here in the house, maybe upwards of 12 to 15, but you can still get really good quality. But things that we have to watch out for are, hey, the walk that we're using in our house is a lot smaller than an industrial one, right? So don't overcrowd this pan, right? Otherwise, we'll, again, we'll be steaming things and not tan searing them and frying them like we really want to. So, so yeah, be careful of that. Um, all right, so let's get this started. Let's gonna trust the uh, lighter over here. Question, if that is regular oil, what the neutral oil? Yes, it's a neutral oil. So this is a vet, uh, canola oil, but please stay away from olive oil. Stay away from that. You want something with a high smoke point that can get really super hot. Um, and then that's not going to flavor too much, right? So maybe like not like a peanut oil, but like a safflower oil would be great. Um, you know, otherwise canola or veggie oil is fine. So we're going to get this super ripping hot. What we're going to do is we're kind of going to swirl the oil around to lubricate the, the edges of, uh, of the wok and make sure that it's a really like slick surface. Okay, so this is going to go super fast. So remember, just be careful when we're putting things into the walk. We want to always, you know, lay them away from us rather than flopping it towards us and then the oil comes into us. So again, I just seasoned these shrimp with a little bit of salt and pepper, patted them super dry, and we're going to get some nice call on them. And then again, remove them. Then we'll do the same thing for the lap chong. While we're waiting, how about this? We need like 30 seconds for this. I'm going to crack two eggs because uh, we need to whisk these up for our scramble. So... We can do that. I appreciate the practicality. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, every I, I just I, I eat this honestly just with eggs and scallion oil, like just incorporated with the rice. You don't have to get crazy and use all these components. It just let the let the ingredients speak for themselves, you know, utilize the proper technique, and you guys will be eating really good Cantonese food. Um, John, you're not sweating, so I don't think you're like having fun over there. You're usually sweating when you cook. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's okay now, but again, let's let's come back, come and talk to me in three minutes. All right, so let's let's test this real quick. Yeah, all right, so shrimp are in. And this is also going to like flavor the oil, right? The wok. So, you know, it's good to get that nice and caramelized. And again, we don't want to overcook this because again, we're going to mix it all together once we incorporate the rice. So literally 30 seconds, don't touch it. Let it get some nice color. Then we're going to put it out right into this bowl right here. Woo! Oil dancing. Someone just commented that they were impressed by your egg cracking abilities with just one oh, thank hand. You. Many eggs, many an egg have been cracked in my <laughs> lifetime. I also think, John, like we used to eat this a lot late night because well, you get whatever you got in the fridge, you pull it together, and it's uh, it always tastes better at midnight. <laughs> right, so super simple, just a little bit of nice color there, right? Not too much. Again, this is going to cook again. Put this right aside. Right? Okay, you never, you never want to overcook the shrimp. It's quick. Okay, and. What I'm going to do here is I want to put a little bit of this oil away because I don't need it all and I don't want to burn everything down. All right, so in with the Chinese sausage, this is the lap chung, okay? Woo! All right. Oh, I forgot one. These are like super sweet, super salty when they get nice and caramelized. Oh man, there's a lot of sugar on there. So that like, you know, only encourages just like that. It's called a Maillard reaction. Um, and that's what forms a nice crust on steaks, on chicken. It's essentially the reaction of oil and salt and heat. Um, so man, so this oil is all, remember, getting flavored. And Andrew, to your point, I felt the first drop. The first drop is here. So <laughs> it's starting to get hot. Ventilation, this is like a, a eight by eight kitchen here in Queens. So, wow, look at this. I bet you it smells delicious. This is good. So like, we want to make sure that we watch this, right? Because it's super fast. Again, this is going to cook again. I want to make sure I don't burn it. It's getting nice and charred, right? Check that out. All right, so let's take them off. And then this oil is what we're going to make our eggs. We're going to basically scramble some eggs, right? At high heat though. So remember. You might think it's a lot of oil, but everything here is going to come together. All right. So in with the eggs, we're going to be super decisive, right? A couple big strokes um, and you'll see they'll form. So for the shrimp and the sausage, what are you setting that down on? Just a plate? Yeah, it's just a bowl. There's no um, paper towel or anything absorbing the grease. Okay. I want the grease. I want the grease. Want that the is grease. flavor. Okay, this is good enough on my egg, right in the same bowl. That almost looked like a science experiment. It looked cool. <laughs> All right, now we're going to move super fast here, okay? We're going to come in with our aromatics, ginger and garlic. All right, we're going to do our scallion whites. And we want to maybe toast these for about... 30 seconds to a minute, keep it going, keep it stirring, right? You're gonna smell it. You're gonna smell it when you when it's time, right? You gotta use, utilize your senses when you're cooking, right? You can touch a steak and tell when it's done, or, you know, you can smell when butter is burning and you have to take cookies out of the fridge or, or out of the oven. So now we're gonna keep going. In with our veggies, bell peppers. Remember, these have a little bit of moisture in it. So we wanna take out all the moisture. Okay. Now, what we haven't talked about yet is what we're going to deglaze the pan with, which is soy sauce, oyster sauce, and my favorite cooking condiment of all time, which is shaoxing wine. 
This is amazing stuff. I use it all the time. Um, it's going to add a nice, nice balance to the dish. All right, so these are getting nice and toasty. What we're going to do now is add our ají amarillo, just a little bit. And then right in with our rice. All right. Make sure you talk. Talk, talk, talk. Keep it moving. Look at those skills. Yeah, and I think one something that separates, like sometimes I ask, why is my fried rice never as good as when I go out? And the answer is pretty simple. You just add more oil. <laughs> it's coming together. The sweat's coming off. Whoop! So now we're gonna deglaze with that soy sauce on the edge. Okay. And you can always re-season and retaste. I when I I never use like measurements. I just cook with you know, again, you gotta cook with cook with your senses, really. All right, so it's gonna change the color, all right. About enough. A little bit of sashay wine, Woo! right on the edge. Okay, and then pop. All right. Now the party's almost over, but we gotta talk about the guests of honor, which are our guys over here. In with the shrimp, in with the sashay. Pick it up. Ooh, 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 ooh. Right. We're done. Off key. What we're going to do here is incorporate a little bit of uh, this is oyster sauce. Okay, it's so a little salty umami. We'll go a little. And a little bit of sesame oil. This adds a nice roundness. Okay, toasted oil. And. Peas and carrots, right? Off heat. These were frozen peas and carrots. That's totally fine. Um, just make sure you thaw them. Make sure that, you know, they're super dry. Okay. So add a little bit of color. Finally, we have some green onion. Okay. Woo. There we go. Boys and girls. <laughs> we're ready to eat. Mm. Oh. That looks incredible. Wow. That's amazing. I wish I could have a bite. I think sometimes oh, also like a lot of chifa, which is Peruvian Chinese, it's not necessarily that complex. It just has a lot of good flavors and combinations mm. of flavors. Um, and I think that's really what makes it unique, you know, because it's bringing all the cultures, all the histories, all the different spices and ingredients and produce. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to taste good at the end of the day. I think that's what's most important with food. Sorry guys, I'm oh, moving some stuff out of the way before I kill myself. Um, all right, so let's move the camera angle here. Um, baby, thank you. We do do deliver, we want some deliveries, Jonna. Oh yeah? For those well, living in New York City. <laughs> all right, so here we have a very nice cutting board and you know, Again, I would normally just serve this on a table, right? Like family style. Everybody takes a whole bunch. Um, maybe serve a nice little, you know, little, little piece of fish with this. But for you guys, just to be extra special, I'm going to do a little plating preparation here. I'm going to get my rice into a bowl. Same bowl that has a little bit of that oil and that grease. So I don't want it to stick. I'm basically going to invert this onto... Like a flat plate, so I can uh, so we can take a nice, really nice picture. <laughs> See, the phone has to eat first. The phone must eat first. So, Andrew, we should tell them about the story. I mean, all the different times that we've eaten. How many times do you think you've eaten arroz chao in your life? Oh man, at least at least I would say probably five hundred times. I don't know, some combination of rice fried rice. Um, I mean, even in the Chinese cuisine, uh, you know, our grandmother, we used to make a lot of, I mean, you can incorporate almost anything into rice, but like salted, salted fish fried rice is pretty amazing. Um, you know, there's just so many, you know, you could do dried uh, salty uh, scallops as well, which is really uh, delicacy as well. 
Yeah, fried rice every week. I'm reading the messages. And again, maybe we'll do a, a completely veggie version, but all right, so this is for this is for all the marbles here. Let's see. <laughs> Pressure. Hold on. You're on the spot, Hold man. On. You're on the spot. Let's be careful here. <gasps> Oh, what a beat. That deserves applause. A little off center, <laughs> a little off center, but we're going to work with it. You know what? I made some extra, so I'm not even going to worry about it. We're going to do a little, we're going to plate it later. This one's going to be eaten on premises immediately. <laughs> hey, we got a comment that Cubans are actually all about fried rice and plated the same in the bowl like that. <laughs> Already finding similarities. Shout out to our family, our family friend Flor de Mayo in New York City or Pio Pio. Love the squid ink fried rice with pollo a la brasa, which is the Peruvian uh, roasted chicken. So if anyone lives in Manhattan, Flor de Mayo on Amsterdam or Pio Pio is amazing. They have a great ají, which is a you know a green sauce, uh, which we've tried to replicate and we've gotten close. We're like ninety percent of the way there, right, Jonah? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I was actually in the area today, uh, you know, at a restaurant trying to support, you know, some other small business and it actually happened to be a Peruvian restaurant. So I was happy that they invited me there. But um, yeah, that sauce is like a lot of jalapenos. It's a lot of white vinegar, very acidic, but it's like, it's flavorful. It's tart. Um, there's a lot of mayonnaise in there. So if you're going to make your own mayonnaise, that's going to go the extra step. And that's obviously what they do every day in house. But yeah, I mean, but a good roast about... chicken, John, a good roast chicken can go with this fried rice really well. I mean, at Florida Mayo, they do um, a vinegar-based tomato sauce, if you remember, that goes with it. Yeah, this is like, and again, the reason why this is so good is because the rice is dry, so it's separate. So every single granule has a little bit of that smoky, oily flavor. But I literally, I was just telling, I was just telling everyone that, you know, I just went to go check out the store, the restaurant, which I did, and I just ate a lot of food, but I'm going to have to take a bite because you guys don't mind. Get a little bit of shrimp in there, <laughs> a little bit of lap chong. Looks Can't good. beat it. Looks good. <clears throat> So Jonah, could you tell us a little bit about how you might make this a vegetarian version of this? Sure. So obviously I would start with um, a lot of mushrooms. I really like mushrooms and they really, when you cook them down and remove all that moisture, like even just with a little bit of salt and pepper on them, they let them speak for themselves. Again, we were talking about tofu um, and honestly, cutting your ingredients in a similar size, that is the most important thing, right? Because we want things to be Right. I still want a little bit of the bite on the pepper, right? And also the onion, but I don't want it overcooked. And I, but I want the shrimp, right? So if I were to put everything together and just sear everything, it would taste good, but you wouldn't get the same textural components. You wouldn't get, you know, like I'm getting a lot of bounciness and, and really good chewiness from the shrimp. It's perfectly cooked, right? Again, we talked about the crust on the lap chong. It's super salty, super sweet. I'm getting like a lot of clean notes from all the fresh, honestly, the, the green onion that's on top, that's like cleansing the palate. The ají amarillo is coming on the back and it's making me sweat some more. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, again, like I would just obviously omit the Chinese sausage. I would omit the shrimp, but you can very easily use broccoli. You can use cauliflower. You can use squash. Again, carrots, celery, uh, all those things are, are, are certainly, certainly work in this like stir fry technique. Yeah. I find it too, John, that sometimes when you add too much though, you get lost and sometimes you just, you want to pick a few stars in terms of the ingredients and keep it simple. I think it tastes better. Yeah. Um, I mean, this one, we, you know, we, we knew we were teaming up with EDF and we have to go above and beyond, but don't kill yourself. Right. My favorite one that I always make is a few ingredients. It's green onion, the whites and the greens, some ginger, garlic. That's it. Soy sauce. Yes. Chinese wine that we use. Yes. A little bit of oyster sauce little white pepper. Yep. Yeah, but everything else is just simple. There's a little bit of egg in there. And again, it just, it really hits home. It's like a comfort food and a comfort meal that you, you know, and this is just its own specific version, right? We're not even talking about sticky rice, Cantonese style, or just, 
you know, the arguments that people get into just washing their rice or the different types of rice that they use, uh, you know, like some people like their rice a little bit more wet, some like it a little bit more dry, right? Um, so there's always that preference. Mm, I mean. You've emphasized a lot, um, obviously, the importance of wok and wok hay, but, if someone, but you know, not everyone in our audience might have a wok at home for various reasons. So, if, you know, someone went into your kitchen, stole your wok, but you were desperate to make this dish, what kind of cookware would you reach for instead? So, again, it would have to be like something nonstick. A cast iron would work, but it's so heavy, right? So you just have to, would constantly have to move it. And then really think about like the circular area of a walk really, I mean, enables you to like twist it um, in, in, in ways in which other regular pots and pans don't really work. So honestly, that's the reason why I, I believe it's so, you know, methodical, right? I mean, there's a reason why there's restaurant quality walk egg, which I can sort of taste in this dish because, you know, as I flick the edge of the walk, the flame that's coming up is catching fire and everything is combusting like in the air and everything is mixing. So um, I hope that answered your question. I mean, and, and walks aren't too expensive. I think I, I was at Ikea the other day and they sell walks for $12. Obviously they're not the same. You can't really get that layer of flavor on there, but I mean, it still provides that functionality of being able to, to move things around. Um, so yeah, I mean, 12 bucks at Ikea, you can't beat it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think the most, the most important uh, components of that Again, we talked about it, using a real flame, using a real combustion, and then also that the wok is uh, cast iron, right? Not, not, sorry, not cast iron, but carbon steel, excuse me, carbon steel. It's going to be light, and then you have to also, like, take care of the wok. So you'll hear people talk about seasoning the wok, which is a real thing, right? So essentially that whole process, that starts before you even start cooking, but then it also is involved, like, when you're cleaning the wok and maintaining it, like, you're adding layers of flavor, but Essentially what you're doing is adding oil and you basically turn your range on until you burn a, like a, a surface, a layer of oils onto the surface of the wok. And that way it's, it's naturally oil uh, slick free. So that's why it, everything moves so freely and each granule of rice is able to like, you know, it's not sticking to the pan here, right, at all. Um, so when I got this wok, it's actually like an off gray, but when you do season it, right, and again, that's a process that takes like a couple hours at least. Um, and it will involve you definitely turning off your smoke alarm if you're in an apartment because you're basically rubbing oil into it with like a, a paper cloth until you can, until it turns black. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, I don't know, honestly, walks get a lot of hate. I love cooking in a walk. It's, it's really big, it's maneuverable, it's light. When I make pastas, guess what I'm using to boil the water for the pasta? It's this, right? The, the, I mean, all the spaghettis, they, they fit perfectly on here. And you can, John, you can use that as a steamer too, if you have a big top. It's, I mean, that's perfect for steaming because it has that depth. There we go, right? I mean, case in point, this bamboo steamer fits directly on this walk. So really versatile, functional. Um, and again, just like you saw, I mean, you can fry perfect scrambled eggs as well. Uh, but these are, what I love about Cantonese cooking in uh, specifically is just like, it, it lets the ingredients speak for themselves and the cooking process is always very fast. It's always about, you know, making sure that you're organized and have all your meats and plot ready. And then, as you know, this thing took like literally three minutes to come together. Great. So I think this is a good time to move into the just like the Q&A and discussion part of our demo. And so if you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the, in the Q&A. Um, we're also monitoring the chat. So if you've already put something there, we'll get to it. But um, the first question that we have from Jeff in here, he asks, can you share the origins of the word chaofa and chifa? I think it would be cool for folks to know. Sure. Um, Andrew, take this one. <laughs> So I don't know specifically what chifa means. Uh, grow, uh, our, our dad grew up in Peru and we used to live there. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about the history of, of Chinese in Peru and kind of Chinese immigrants around the world. I think I saw a chat about, you know, in Cuba as well, in Venezuela, in Mexico. Um, but uh, late 1800s, uh, just like uh, in the US, there was a lot of need for, for labor. Uh, agricultural labor, building things. Um, and our great-great-great-grandfather on our mom's side 
thought he was catching a boat to uh, San Francisco, but instead ended up in Lima. Uh, obviously, he didn't speak Spanish, only spoke Chinese. Um, but he started a life there, but he was kind of, kind of like an indentured uh, servant in a way where he had to work off a portion of the cost to get there. Um, and over the years, I think they estimate now up to 20% of Peru has some Chinese blood, Chinese or, or Japanese blood. So it's a significant population. It's like more than five or 6 million people have a portion of Chinese blood. And you go to, if you go to Peru, I mean, it's pretty crazy. It's kind of like McDonald's here or any joint that's everywhere, Starbucks. You literally will find a chifa like every three, four blocks. And, and sometimes you'll find multiple chifas in, in, um, in a block. But um, yeah, I don't know exactly what the word means. I should look that up. But, um, well, chow fan, right? So fan is rice, chow is to fry, right? Chow mean is, you know, fried noodles, right? Yeah. So. So they, it could be a play on the words in, in terms of chow fa instead of saying chow fan. Yeah, it's like a... They, they just shortened it for the Spanish, you know, the Spanglish version of it, and they say chow fa. So. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that's what we love. Just the, the blending of We cultures. also have another question here. Uh, what other Peruvian Chinese dishes do you recommend? Um, so, I mean, I think Peru, John, you can speak to this too. So the cuisine is, is really good. I think a lot of people have discovered it rec in the recent years just because it has that diversity, not just culturally, but from a microclimate and geography. There's so many different regions in Peru. You have the rainforest in the Amazon. You have the coast where the capital is in Lima. You have desert. Um, and then you have mountains uh, like in Cusco and Arequipa. So, you know, you have a huge diversity of the types of food and the type of product of food. Um, but then you have that cultural component where you've had a lot of Japanese and Chinese influence over the years and, and you made a lot of different, uh, Lomo Sadala, if you've ever tried it, it's one of my favorites. There's a lot of iterations. You can go cheap with like a cheap cut of meat or you can go fancy with a ribeye or even a filet, uh, depending on how fancy you want to get it. If it's Valentine's Day, you guys think you got to go with the, the higher end. Um, but uh, um, I mean, so many ceviches too, John. So many, there's so many plays on ceviches as well. If you guys live in New York, really recommend Flor de Mayo. I really recommend the Pollo a la Brasa from, uh, from uh, Pio Pio. Another big one is Anticuchos. It's not necessarily Peruvian Chinese, but it's, it's one of my favorite dishes, beef heart. It's the number one street food in, in, uh, in Peru and you eat it with the, the fried fresh donuts called the picarones. Um, but I don't know, John, what's, what's your go-to Peruvian Chinese? Yeah, I mean, I would have to say Lomo Saldado. Other than this dish that we just made, I'd probably make that the most. Um, and, you know, it's, again, it's soy sauce, French fries, rice, carbs on carbs. And like Andrew said, you, if you're going cheap, then you would use like a flank steak. Um, you know, if you're a little higher end, maybe like a sirloin or a ribeye, but very similar in preparation, right? We're, we're going to be pan searing meat. Then we're adding the tomatoes and the onions and it's all served like over some rice with a nice, beautiful braising liquid that comes from the beef um, and the mixture of the soy sauce and all the ginger and the garlic. Um, so it's super homey. I mean, I, I remember Papi, our dad, making us different versions of that, right? There's some that are more vinegar based, right? And then some, I mean, honestly, just the way that my family made it was adding a little dollop of ketchup as well. So it little, made it a little bit more sweet. Um, so the sauce was, wasn't as thin and we use a cornstarch slurry mixture, right. To like sort of thicken it, to make it more of like a, you know, like again, the, that comfort meal. And that was just our way of doing it. But, you know, like today I, I was in Jackson Heights and I was at another Peruvian restaurant called Urubamba and they definitely had, they had an arroz chafa on the menu. Right. So obviously the, uh, the Chinese influence was there, but yeah, I mean, they had like picarones, they had empanadas, they had um, you know, they're all different types of ceviches. Aji de gallina is another Peruvian dish that has some Chinese influence as well. But it's just use a lot, utilizing a lot of those like spices. Aji amarillo, aji rocoto, right? Angie was talking about the, uh, the anticuchos, the, the cow heart, which I also was able to try. So that's like rubbed in a, a beautiful aji rocoto spice. And then it's seared and it's served with choclo, which is like a, it's basically a huge sweet corn. It's not as sweet as our, our normal American corn here, but I mean, it's monstrous. It's like a dinosaur corn and, and it's great. It's, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, the ceviches, you, you have access to the water, you have access to the Andes. I mean, obviously the potato itself, right, comes from Peru. Not many people know that. Um, you know, over 4,000 
in, uh, indigenous species in the Andes there, uh, you know, super nutritious. And that's why a lot of the staples of the, you know, the South American diet, on, in, in all honesty, was uh, potato based. So, yeah. But I, I don't discriminate. I'll eat it all. <laughs> I, just, I just can't make it all. So I'm learning myself, right? Like, I guess we can talk about that. I mean, I'm not a formally trained chef by any means. I never went to culinary school. Um, I just enjoyed cooking. You know, Andrew and I always cooked when we were younger and our grandparents cooked a lot when we were growing up and they helped raise us. Um, so, you know, we were always around it the, during the weekends. Uh, we were sharing, you know, sort of like family meal, uh, Cantonese style, whether it was dim sum or whether it was, uh, you know, like, again, family style dinner where there's a lazy Susan and you order 10 to 15 main dishes and everybody shares everything, right? And everybody gets a little bit of everything. Um, so that was what we were accustomed to growing up with. That's what I miss most. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that things are starting to open up and we can actually experience shared meals again in, uh, in public and not just at home. So I think yeah. that's something to look forward to. Definitely. And I think you guys kind of have touched upon this already, but uh, we talk about how food is so integral to our cultural identity. Um, do you guys have any reason, like, why do you think that is? Especially, like, it, I would like to know with your expertise and doing what you do. Like, why do you think it's so integral to who we are and how it represents where we come from? Yeah, well, I think at the most basic level, just, you know, it's, it's it's a necessity, right? You need to have food, but I think it the reason it can transcend and it can really shape identities and cross cultural relations is you can disagree on so many things, but you can't really disagree when you're eating something good and you're enjoying it and you're like, damn. And uh, that genuine experience, like no matter your politics, no matter whatever it is, it could be a great entry point to tackle some of those issues and to talk about things because. It's easier to talk to someone when they're uh, happy than when they're already combative or or angry or hangry is probably the worst. Um, but yeah, John, what, what's your take? Yeah, like Andrew was saying, I mean, I'm able to build and, you know, build relationships through food, through sharing food, through, you know, trying to teach people if they're willing to learn. And I'm not saying that I know everything, but, you know, I, I do take, uh, you know, it's important to me. I take a little bit of pleasure in again, and this has been a long process, but finding my identity as I've been growing up and like being like, hey, it's okay to embrace not only the Chinese in me and the Peruvian and the Colombian, but everything and everybody, right? Um, so in, in that term of mindset, like I wanna apply it to food in the sense that, you know, again, we wouldn't have this food if it wasn't for the immigration of all those Chinese into South America, right? We wouldn't have sashimi and Nikkei cuisine, which is like Japanese, Japanese Peruvian, if it wasn't for the Japanese, right, and 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 all and their expert dealings with fish, so that applies in every respect, right? We talked about the potato earlier, and then you know, I mean, all the where I grew up in New York, the only thing I heard of potatoes was about the potato famine in um, in Ireland, and I myself honestly didn't even know that a potato was Peruvian until I was like you know seven or eight. Um, but again, like being able to travel, me and Andrew were super lucky, and we were able to go to all these places. We've been to Peru many times, so like just how people deal with you when like we are able to speak with them in Spanish and then maybe we can break down a barrier and all of a sudden we're having a conversation with the taxi guy and he's telling us all these things, right? Like, so, and then to be able to incorporate food as well, um, I think is just like, the best vessel, like Andrew said. And um, we're just all about uniting people and, and that food, food storytelling aspect. And, and quick story, um, kind of in line with your organizational mission as well, when it comes to sustainability and the environment and, and issues like that, I feel like um, people can be, have a preconceived notion of how they feel, but like, I mean, I, I remember talk, being in, in, in Lima years ago where, you know, the smog from the exhaust, for example, from cars, it, it's so in your face, just like it would be in, in China, in Beijing. And, you know, I would make a remark like, oh man, like, you know, I wish it wasn't like, and, you know, I kind of got some negative feedback back from like the taxi driver. But then I was like, you know, take me to the best cevicheria. And, and then we, we like had ceviche together. So it, it's a way to, you know, at least have common ground and start a conversation when, when you have difficult, uh, difficult topics or areas of conflict. <clears throat> both for sharing because I feel like you guys both just explained that so beautifully as well and I think Jonah you kind of harped on one concept that I really love and you use the word embrace 
And I think by embracing different cultures is how we empower different cultures and empower one another. So I think it's, it's just such a great takeaway as well that, you know, there's power in embracing all of the different sides of you and you can actually create an even better dish than if you just had one side, you know? So I think you guys are just such a great example and, and I'll let Georgia ask some more questions. <laughs> Well, um, I think that's a perfect setup because I mean, I think so much of what you discussed is how um, your home and your environment have like influenced your taste in food and love for food. And so I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit more about growing up in Queens, you know, as a fellow Queens native, I totally feel you on this. I grew up in Elmhurst. I think you guys are from Jackson Heights. So we're basically brother and sister. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for those of you who are not uh, in New York, Queens is, you know, the most diverse part of New York City. It had its home to like over 800 different languages in that epicenter around Jackson Heights. You really have so many different cultures living side by side. So it'd be really great to hear um, from you guys what it was like growing up there and how you're continuing to engage in that community, especially you, you've kind of mentioned a few times, Jenna, what you're doing with the with restaurants there. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, like uh, we can just equate it to the seven line, right, which starts where I am now in Flushing, and that extends all the way through Jackson Heights, through the heart of Queens, into the city. Um, that is the major mode of transportation for millions of New Yorkers, um, a lot of which are coming, you know, working in the city, coming out from Queens. And again, you start from street zero and end up there, and you will see <laughs> literally 137 different ethnicities or separate restaurants or mom, mom and pop shops. So, you know, I mean, uh, in my role, now that I've transitioned into food media, what I found that I enjoy is sort of, you know, being able to make content for Hungry Wands, um, being able to share a little bit of our family story with our cooking and our, and our like recipes, if you will. And then also now I'm getting into, you know, a lot of these small businesses are struggling, whether or not, you know, all around the country. So I'm just trying to do my part for a community that I feel in touch with, which just happens to be in Jackson Heights. So yeah, like I'm hitting them up and being like, hey, I would love to you know, promote something for you. And then they, <laughs> they give me all this food, all this beautiful food that I can then showcase. And again, um, just share with the world. Maybe, you know, like we didn't talk about this. Maybe we can talk about it next time. But like guinea pig in, in Peru is eaten pretty traditionally. It's called gui, right? We've eaten it, you know, it's, and people have guinea pigs as pets here, right? So it's just, it's like about, it's like, I'm gonna make a Game of Thrones reference, but it's like the wall is there, right? Like we don't decide wh on what side of the wall we're born, right? We're either a wildling or whatever, but you know, we don't decide those things. So why let these imaginary lines Game and- Game of Thrones reference, <laughs> wow. I don't know, I I'm all over the place, but you know what I mean? I just, I just love food and to be, to be able to help in that small way uh, is really important for me. Yeah, I think, I think Jonathan said it perfectly, but I think for any of you that are in New York or that want to visit New York now that things are opening up I recommend take the seven line from Times Square start in Flushing you can get amazing Korean Chinese so many so many places we'd love to give you some recommendations but if you ride the seven line west you know towards the city I mean you can stop you know Woodside Jackson Heights is all Latin American you can get really good Colombian Ecuadorian Mexican and then you go a little bit further up it's in Indian and Bangladeshi at 74th street uh, then you go further up, you can get really, really good Greek in Astoria traditionally. Now it's changed because Astoria is getting so, you know, you know, hippified. <laughs> um, so it might be a little bit different, but it's a really fun day to just stop at each of these places. And even if you don't even have a plan, just stop and then just whatever looks good, get some of it. Um, I think that's a lot of fun. I think you definitely cannot go wrong. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the amazing, amazing Nepalese food that you can also get in Jackson Heights. Like every single Momo cart, well, you can't go wrong. Um, but we have a great, I just wanted to flag this great question we have in the Q&A. Jeff said it's optional, kind of hard. It is kind of hard, but I think uh, I would. it's a great one. He asks, do you have any observations or reflections you can share on the experience of being Asian in Peru versus being Asian in the United States? Similarities or differences? Could be from the food perspective, representation, uh, integration, or anything else. Yeah, I think this is a great point. I was actually talking to my dad about this the other day, but um, I, th I feel like it's significantly different. I think, uh, at least from my perspective and my observations, is in Peru, I feel like the culture is 
uh, mixed a little bit more. I feel like in this country, we have a lot of diversity, but it's still very uh, concentrated, you know, right? Where they don't necessarily mix. I mean, obviously that changes depends, you know, the more urban area you are, that changes more. But I feel like it's not the same as in when like a new cuisine develops, right? Or you have someone who's, you know, such a significant percent of the population that has Chinese blood and that's only in 150 years of history. So I think it's it's, it's pretty different. And then culture is, is very different. Um, when you mix the Asian with the Latin culture, there's definitely differences. And you, you guys probably, uh, Georgia and, and Monica can speak to this, but like, um, I mean, growing up, we've seen the differences in just um, the way the culture interacts. Obviously, you know, in, in a Latin culture, it's a lot, usually a lot more, you know, warm, open, uh, open, more so than the Asian culture that is a little bit sometimes more reserved, but open in a different way, right? So um, I would say that, yeah, con contrasting Peruvian Chinese and Asian Americans, it's definitely, it's definitely different. I feel it's more ingrained. Um, and uh, it's also weird when you see someone, probably to this day for most people, when you see someone who's fully ethnically Chinese, but speaks perfect Spanish, right? Um, and I don't know if you would see that conversely here. So, Jonna, what do you think? I was just going to go back to the seven where it's like, you know, where we grew up, which was mainly Hispanic and where our father had a, a practice, um, you know, and hit most of his clientele base being Hispanic, just, I mean, if I were to just talk to someone on the seven line, I can get all the eyeballs start to turn to me because again, it's like, I'm outwardly, I look Asian. Right. But I'm able to, you know, speak Spanish. So I can use that to my advantage if, you know, like you hear someone talking about me or something or, you know, or again, like break down bear, offer a seat to an old lady who, you know, or, or something else. So that's, you know, that's the extent of, of, of that experience I, for me. I think also, though, you do see that kind of, uh, I don't know if it's a stigma, but like the labeling is in Peru where like you would call, but it, I guess it's more in an endearing way. I would kind of take it personal if someone called me like El Chino, like the Chinese, but like that's very common in Peru. But it's most, it's like from your best friend would do that. And it's kind of in, in an endearing way. Uh, I think that that could be different too. I don't know if you would say that to your friend here uh, the same way. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, that is, that's really interesting to hear and just reflect a little bit about how diverse our experiences can be all across the world. Um, so we have about five minutes left. One of our grand traditions for our APAM events is that um, there's great incentive to come because we just were giving away a lot of wonderful things. So I think <laughs> it's a transition to the giveaway and then if we have time, maybe one or two final questions or something, but um, Helen, are you are you are you out there? Do you have a screen you can share so we can see? Yes, I do. Just give me one second. Let me give a couple. That's the give. That's the best giveaway prize. So. <laughs> Not fair. Do you mind if I guys if I take another bite of this? Please, you do. have to. We need to live vicariously through you. Oh man, you got a fancy you got a fancy system here. Mm. All right. Names. Do you all see this uh, wheel of names? Wheel of names. Yes. <laughs> all right. Ready. Our first uh, winner of the raffle. Drum roll, please. Lisa, congratulations. Um, we will email you with um, different choices that you have and you can choose from um, different options. Georgia, do you mind going through the different raffle prizes we have? Yeah, so um, an abundance of choices. So you can choose uh, uh, you can choose uh, Michelle Zahner's new book, uh, Crying in H Mart from um, bookshop.org. You can choose uh, a $25 gift card to the following businesses, rooted.com. It's like an on online plant store. I bought my mother a, a plant from there. It was beautiful. Uh, Wing, and, Wing and Wow, uh, which is a porcelain shop in Chinatown. Um, they have really, really beautiful stuff and they have plenty of options around that price range. You can win a $25 gift card to Amsam, which is another food related thing, which um, they do these like flavor packets that make cooking really, really easy. And they work with a lot of great restaurants around New York City to develop those recipes. 
Um, there is a wonderful snack box. Oh my goodness, look at this. <laughs> they, they know the plug. Which ones do you have? I got them all. <laughs> which one? Which ones are your favorite? Which one should, if they choose the Amsam, which should they get? Okay, to be honest, I saw they just gave me the Vietnamese, they just gave me the Southeast package. So I had the East Asian package. Um, I really like the, I mean, I really like the spicy bulgogi one. I actually didn't even use it with pork, which would be the, the normal application in the Korean style. Um, I use it with tofu. So go check out my Instagram. Uh, you go, go check out the Hungry Ones Instagram if you want to see a video on how to make that. Oh my goodness. Well, that sounds, I might have to buy that. Um, and then the last thing, the last item is a one month uh, subscription or like, I guess a gift box to an Indian snack shop. It looks really, really good. So we will reach out to you with those options. And I think we have one more, one more prize to give away, right? Yes. Um, and this is the last prize. Um, so you're the last off. winner. <laughs> yes. Okay. Ooh. Reiner, congratulations. Yay, go Reiner. <laughs> well, thank, uh, so we have about one minute left. Are there any um, final words you want to leave us with? Any, uh, you know, well, we will definitely plug um, your, your social. You also kindly provided the recipe for this. So we'll definitely be sure to share that with the group. But if there's anything else you want to share right now. Sure. Well, thank you guys so much for having us. It was a lot of fun. You got to see Jonna sweat. So that's always a plus. Um, and if you guys are ever interested, we're, we're, we just started a new venture called Nabuya Travelers, where we explore Latin America from a food angle um, and kind of take people per on personalized tours. We're, we're doing our first trip to Guatemala. We'll be climbing volcanoes. Um, and it's called NabuyaTravelers.com. It's Nabuya Travelers on Instagram as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we appreciate it if you guys can support us on Instagram at Hungry Wands at HungryWands.com. And um, it was a lot of fun. And you, what about you, Jonah? No, I mean, obviously, you know, Hungry Wands is our baby and Nobuya Travelers is something that we're super excited about. Um, you know, if you want really specific recipe centered content, please, we're keeping it all in the hungry thing. So Hungry Jonah, Hungry underscore Jonah is my personal account. Please show the support. Um, you can see recipes like this. You can see different types of recipes. I mess up all the time. I just try to have fun in the kitchen and we're all just trying to learn. So again, thank you guys EDF for having us. It was a pleasure. Um, it was really fun. And now I have tons of leftovers. So I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you so, 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 so much. You guys are incredible. And again, everyone go check them out on their socials. It, it, this was so much fun and so informative too and, and inspiring more than anything. I think you guys have such a great story and it, you clearly know what you're doing. And I just wish I was in your kitchen right now. <laughs> yeah, and if you guys, we do private events, if you got a birthday party, we can, we can roast the whole pig for you. Ooh, <laughs> lechong. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So yeah. anyway, thank you guys so much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. All thank right. you so much for joining us for APAM. Woohoo! Make sure you, you make this recipe. Jonathan, you better send me some. Thank you Josh again for connecting us. Yeah, yeah thank yes. you so much, Josh. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna, <coughs> excuse me. We'll have to do something again like this soon. Otherwise, you know, hit me up on IG. Maybe I'll do a little giveaway myself and uh, do a little uh, free virtual Ooh. class. But uh, you know you gotta you gotta make sure you're subscribed. So make sure you do that. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Right. Sorry, shameless plug. Shameless plug. All right, see you guys. I love it. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have Thank a you great weekend, guys. Bye. Bye. Ciao.